the second week of our teaching series here called Legacy, and we, we are focusing on uh, leaving a spiritual legacy, man, that impacts people for all eternity. Uh, when you think of the term legacy, normally we think about achievements, right? You think about, man, what a great legacy someone like, like uh, Joe DiMaggio left for all my baseball guys that are out there. Incredible, incredible baseball player. Or we think about wealth and how someone left behind a great inheritance or they had some kind of great, you know, um, a, a, a corporation they built from the ground up. You think of someone like a, like a Disney, right? But legacy is so much more than those things. In fact, last week we talked about how you actually live not once, you live twice. You know, you have, you have a little play on YOLO there. You live twice. You live this life here, and then you live again in eternity, right? Your life actually continues. It, it's eternal. And so all of us are going to stand before the Lord one day. We talked about this last Sunday, that we're all going to stand before God, and we're going to give an account for our lives. And so for those of us who are not believers, if you've not said yes to Christ, you'll give an account for the Lord, and all you'll have to offer is your life and your works. And it doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa. Like, your works are never good enough. They'll never measure up to God. And so if all you have to offer him is your works and your life, that will be insufficient. And you'll end up spending eternity apart from the Lord. But believers, you know, we have to offer up Jesus. We've placed our faith in Christ, and we're not good enough on our own. But because Jesus took our place and paid our bill, God pardons us, and we spend eternity with the Lord forever. However, our works are also judged. Our works are not overlooked. What you do matters. We talked about this last week in 1 Corinthians 3, where, where Paul d- talks about how our works determine our eternal reward. They don't determine your destination as a Christian, but they do determine the kind of reward that you're going to get. And so it, it does matter how generous you are. It does matter how you spend your time. It does matter how you serve people. It does matter if you're pouring into others and reaching them for Christ. A spiritual legacy is really truly all-encompassing. It encompasses absolutely everything. Now, what kind of mindset does it take to leave a spiritual legacy? And I want to talk about the mindset we should have today. That's, that's where I want to spend some time at. What kind of mindset does it take? Because there's two types of mindsets that you see in people when you talk about resources and that kind of thing. I think, one, you see people who, man, they're ready to meet any need. Like, they are there to meet whatever need that you happen to have. They're going to donate. They're going to leverage their networks. They're going to write checks. They're going to do whatever they can do. And, and a lot of them will do it by faith. Some of the most generous people I know are people who, like, they'll meet a need and they can meet it in the moment, but they may not be able to meet it later. Like, they have enough just for right now. Enough time, enough finances, enough resources, whatever it might be, but they'll meet that need because their mindset says this. There's a lot more where that came from. Like, I trust in the Lord who will provide for me. He'll, he'll redeem my time. He'll, he'll redeem my finances. Whatever it is, I'm going to meet that need because I trust God. And the other type of person you'll find, the other, other mindset when a need arises says this. We can't. <laughs> I don't got enough people. I don't got enough finances. I don't got enough skill sets. I don't got enough anything. We just can't meet it right now. Two types of mindsets. And whichever one you possess will largely determine, I think, the impact you can have for God in a certain situation. You know, because resources, finances, assets, networks, whatever, they tend to be one of. They're not the premier, but they tend to be one of the premier testing grounds that the Lord will use to determine the level of faith that you have. And you're going to either live with this mindset of, I, I, I don't have enough, which is scarcity, or there's more where that came from, which is abundance. You're going to live with one or the other. That's, that's the mindset that you're going to have, scarcity or abundance. And that scarcity or abundance mindset, man, it hits you long before it hits your wallet. The prophet Haggai talked about having a scarcity mindset. And this kind of gives you some context what I'm going to read here in a moment. The Jews have returned back from exile. The, the, the Babylonians took the remaining folks from Judah into exile. Persia came in. They toppled Nebuchadnezzar's descendants. And so now you have Xerxes. He goes, hey, let the people go back to go back to, to Israel. And so the folks are going back to their homeland. They begin to rebuild the, the walls. They begin to rebuild the temple. And then all of a sudden the work stops. The work of building the temple of the Lord ceases. And in the Old Testament, there is a link between God's blessing and doing God's work. It's pretty clear. 
And the people were not doing the work that God had asked them to do. They'd abandoned working for the Lord. And so there was a, a, a problem. They had a scarcity mindset. They were living in lack at that point as a result. So the prophet Haggai says this, and just see this sounds familiar to you, okay? Haggai 1, verses 5 and 6. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army says. Look at what's happening to you. You've planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you can't keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. I always like that. I, you feel that way right now, don't you? You're like, man, my money feels like it's going right on out when I put it in there. Yeah. The truth is, you know, we can be doing what God has asked us to do, living a life that God's called us to live, and then still feel like we can't get ahead because we have a scarcity mindset. Scarcity, not just a mindset, it's also a cycle. It's a cycle as well. And it kind of goes like this, right? So here, here, here's how the, the cycle works. God supplies your needs, okay? He meets every need that you have. God supplies your needs. Food, clothing, shelter, finances, job, whatever, it's all met. Your needs are met. You consume what he supplies, and then, of course, you start to lack. You know, I'm, I'm, he's given give me something. I'm living off of that. I don't have enough now. And then, instead of looking to the Lord as, hey, he's my supplier. He'll give me more. He'll take care of me. What some folks do is they begin to have anxiety and, and they feed that anxiety fear and all that builds in your life and all of a sudden what happens you take matters into your own hands and you begin consuming more than you should anyone remember the the great toilet paper raid of 2020 you know what i'm saying like, like covid was a respiratory virus but one of the first things that goes missing is toilet paper and you can't find it i mean for like a year and a half there's a limit you can only take two packs when you leave the store. I got to the point where I thought, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to put it in the ground and see if it grows on a tree. Like, I need toilet paper, man. What are we going to do? And how, why, why does that happen? It's because people freak out. They're panicking. Anxiety. Scarcity. I may not have enough. Now, that's kind of important. You kind of want enough of that. But nevertheless, like you, you may not have enough. And so they begin hoarding the toilet paper. If you're going to leave an impact spiritually, you have to defeat the scarcity mindset. God has called you to live an abundant life. And so Paul, he ends his letter to the Ephesians and he writes this in Ephesians 3.20. Now all glory to God who is able through his uh, uh, father uh, power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Might ask or think. God's able to do what? He's able to do more infinitely than we might ask or think. That, that's an abundant mindset. It's a mindset that says, with Christ, there's more where that came from. There's more where that came from. Everything is about, you know, about God. Everything about God's Holy Spirit working within us. It starts with this, with this abundance mentality. God has more. God can give more. God will provide more. But if you live with a scarcity mindset, you begin to live a contrarian kind of life. And living in scarcity is really out of step with God's abundance. Abundance has nothing to do, by the way, with what's in your bank account. It has nothing to do with, with the network and how large it is. It has everything to do with the God that you serve. Everything to do with the Lord that you serve. Now, there's a real enemy in all this as well, right? There's a real devil, and we're aware of that. And, and if God came to give an abundant life, what has he come to do? Well, he's come to do the opposite. This is the words of Jesus in John 10.10. 10. Listen to what he says here. The thief, that's the devil, right? The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. In other words, he's come to give you a more abundant life. That's what Christ has come to do. You know, give an abundant life. God is a God of abundance. If you're going to defeat the scarcity mindset and you're going to leave a spiritual legacy, you have to live an abundant life. So I want to take you to the Old Testament today. I want to take you to a story that illustrates how this abundance mentality works, okay? 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings 4, verse number 1. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and he cried out, or she cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and he knew how he feared the Lord, but now a creditor has come, and he's threatening to take my two sons as slaves. 
Now let me just kind of put in the context what's happening a little bit. So in, in this era, if you're a woman, there's not a whole lot you can do. Right? Just, there's just not, not, your, your ways of making a living are super limited. Your husband's your provider, and if you don't have a husband, then your son is your provider. And if your son, you, you don't have a kid, or your sons are old enough, you better hope you have an uncle, a brother, some kind of male relative who will take you in and be generous. Otherwise, there's not a whole lot you can do. And in her case, her two sons are not old enough. They're actually uh, much younger. Right? And they can't hold down jobs. And, and worse behind this is, is that her husband, not only is he dead, her husband has left all of his debts to her. It's like, thank you very much. This is, this is, this is not a, a message on debt, but I will just throw this out there for some of us this morning. Hey, can I just tell you, like, personally for me, I do not believe in anything called good debt. All right? I don't believe in good debt. Now, I have debt. I have a house. And there are times where you have to pull it out. I mean, we don't have $400,000, most of us, lying around to put down a house. So I get it. Like, you have to go into debt. But do everything you can to get out. Proverbs says the borrower is a slave to the lender, right? Like, you want everything you can to be debt-free. And, and, and in this situation, her husband, he was enslaved to a lender. He owed money. And when he died, there's no life insurance back then, right? So he can't take care of his family the way we can now. And she is saddled with all this debt. What is she going to do? How is she going to pay it? How is she going to get out? Can I just tell you, I think there's some animosity she probably had towards him as well because of that. Now, if you can't pay your debts back then, you don't go to debtor's prison, you don't declare bankruptcy, you, you're going to have to pay it off. And how are you going to pay it off? Well, she can't do it, but she has two sons, and they can enslave her sons, not forever, but for a certain number of years until that debt is paid. That was law back then. You could do that. And so she says in verse number two, or Elisha says in verse number two, what can I do? All right, what can I do? Elisha asks, tell me, what do you have in the house? She says, nothing at all. Nothing, not a thing. Except a little flask of olive oil. That's it. Not argue, man, this widow, she's, she's probably upset with God. She's probably upset with her situation that she's in, with her husband for, for putting her in the situation that she has. And, and she's like, I got nothing in my home, no, nothing at all. Just this little olive oil jar that I got laying over here. She, 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 she's desperate, right? I'm sure she is. She's probably freaking out, some of you guys, man. You know, just think about how you handle anxiety. <laughs> how do you handle anxiety when you feel stressed? I mean, just, that's, that's where she's at. She, she's, she's struggling here. And you might find yourself today in a similar place. And you look at your life and you're like, you know what, Pastor, I got a lot going on. My, I, I don't, I feel overwhelmed with all that I have happening in my life right now. I don't know where I'm going to turn to for this. I don't know how this is going to come through over here. I'm just, you know, I, I just, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And, and if you're here this morning and things are going well for you, fantastic. At, at some point it won't though, right? Because at some point, all of us, it's called life. We're all going to find ourselves with our backs against the wall, trying to figure out what are we going to do? Where are we going to turn? And, and really we're going to become mad at God too, a little bit. We're probably going to shout, Hey God, give me a break. Like all these other people get breaks and I never get any where's mine like we all, I'm sure she's thinking the same kind of thing like we're gonna find ourselves there and when you do and if you're here this morning and you're already there can I just tell you that if you have a scarcity mindset you're not gonna make it and the reason why you're not gonna make it is because the scarcity mindset causes us to panic and I don't know about you, but I've never heard of anyone making a good decision when they panic. And if we're not careful, the scarcity mindset can also cause us to be so overwhelmed with anxiety and fear and downright depression that we can make the wrong decision that, that becomes a fatal decision. You don't want to be in a scarcity mindset with your back against the wall in a situation that seems overwhelming. So what I want to do today is teach you three principles, three practical keys, okay, on how to live an abundant life and to defeat scarcity. Because that, that's the way that God designed for us to live, to live abundantly. Here's the first principle right here. Do not diminish what you have. Don't diminish what you have. Because what you have, though you think it's nothing, what you have is actually something. 
right? The widow has this flask of olive oil. It's so insignificant, she labels it as nothing. It has no value whatsoever. And in her region of the world, I mean, she's not incorrect. Olive oil, big deal. It's as common as dirt, paper, whatever. Like, it's just not a big deal over that way. She doesn't even give it a second thought. Don't diminish what you have, because what you have isn't nothing in the hands of God. In the hands of God, it's something. With God's blessing, it's something. The widow is diminishing what she has. Look at the dialogue. There's scarcity there. She says, I have nothing, right? I got nothing in the house. But what is Elisha's mindset? It's an abundant mindset, because Elisha says, what do you have? I got nothing. Okay, but what do you have, right? What do you have? And then she says, I got olive oil. See, Elisha already knows. There's something there. You got something. You don't have nothing. You got something somewhere. Abundance asks the question, what do I have and what can God use? What do I have? What can God use? Scarcity fixes itself on what is missing. You know you have a scarcity mindset when you are constantly focused on what you do not have. How do I get it? Where do I get it? Who will step up? I don't have enough. That is scarcity. It focuses on what you lack. And if you spend more time complaining about your problems than acknowledging the blessings that God has given you, you need God to set you free today from a scarcity mindset. Because God's given you an awful lot. You just may not realize it right now. You have more than you think. There's more good and more resources in your life than what you're giving God credit for. Do not diminish what you have. Second principle, God does the extravagant through the insignificant. God does the extravagant through the insignificant. God works miracles through small things all the time. We forget about that, don't we? You know, a farmer doesn't take the little seed and diminish it. That becomes a great stock of corn, right? Like they view seeds through what they will create, which are huge harvests. They have faith when they put that seed in the ground that if it's given water and exposed to nutrients, it will grow and become the type of harvest they intended for it to be. And in the same way, it's through our seeds of faith that God can do the, the exponential, that God can challenge us and develop us and disciple us. We grow. So back, back to the story real quick. So the widow doesn't have anything. At least she doesn't think she has anything. And so Elisha says, you've got something. You don't have nothing. What's the something that you have? Well, I got some olive oil. Now look at what he says next in verse 3. It says, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors. Now see, Elisha already knows that God isn't going to do something because God's a God of abundance. You got something, you got some oil, here we go. Grab the jars, God's going to do something. He's going to blow your mind, just wait. Then go into your house with your sons, shut the door behind you, pour the olive oil from the flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it's filled. And remember, she has nothing, right? She's got nothing but a small flask of olive oil. She's got a room full of jars. Here's where the rubber is going to meet the road. Here's where it meets the road, okay? Elisha cannot do this for her. This is important. He can't do this for her. She has to make a decision. She, she has to move to a place of scarcity to abundance. Is she going to trust God, right, to do more with what little that she has? Is she going to do that or not? See, God often does the extravagant through what seems in insignificant. Now, why is that? I, I think it's because nobody else can get credit for it. It's too remarkable, too improbable for anybody else to do. You ever been in a situation and you're like, man, that was, that was a God thing. Now, why did you say that? Why did you call it a God thing? Well, you called it that because it was so remarkable. And so, like, the odds were stacked against you so much. There's no other explanation that it had to have been God who pulled this off. That's why we use that term, right? It was God. Yeah, I mean, think about Gideon had, you know, 300 people. He's like, God, I, I, I got all these guys here. And the Lord says, no, 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 keep, keep those guys going home. Those guys going home. I mean, we got down to the dudes who were drinking water with their hand or like a dog. I mean, that's, that's kind of what it got down to. Hey, 300 is enough to go against tens of thousands. Only God can get credit for that kind of victory. David doesn't have a, a, the armor and the sword and the shield to go face a giant. 
like Spanky, you little rascals. He got the slingshot, bro. Slingshot and five stones to go face a giant who's a skilled warrior. Only God can give the credit for that. Thousands of people are, are listening to Jesus teach, and the disciples are telling him they have got to go home. It is late. They are hungry. Have you seen hangry people? Like, they have to go. And Jesus says, hey, what do we got? Well, some kid has a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. That is enough. Let's do it. You know, it's it, it, it all because God, it's what little bit we have, God can expand. Are you tracking with me here this morning? But what little bit we've got, God, God can take and do something significant with it. He takes the small and does something incredible. If you've been a Christian for a while, man, you're familiar with what the, the, the concept of tithing is, I'm sure. And if you're not familiar with it, the concept of tithing involves taking 10% of your income and, and giving it back to God. It, it predates the Old Testament law by some 400 years. It's, it's, it's not a lot. It's $10 out of 100, $1 out of 10. You know, it's, it's not a whole lot that we do. And yet, if we follow obediently through giving God 10%, there's this promise of blessing. The Old Testament is, is, is filled with this. In fact, in the Old Testament, Israel was withholding the blessing a little bit. They had not been faithfully tithing. They hadn't been faithfully doing a lot of things, really, at this point. And so God sends this prophet named Malachi. I was a youth pastor many years ago. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. I had this student, bless her heart. She came up to me and she said, Pastor, I'll, I'll, Pastor Andrew, I want to hear more about Malachi. I was like, Malachi? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, 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 the Malachi prophet. I said, the Italian prophet, the only Italian prophet, the brother Mario, the wheat, like that Malachi? She's like, yeah. I said, his name's Malachi. It's close. It looks like Malachi. It should be Malachi, but it's not. It's Malachi, okay? Malachi 310. Bring all the ties into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple, and if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I'll open the windows of heaven for you, and I'll pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it all in. Try it. Put me to the test. Now, I'm not teaching on tithing today. I, 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 I will do that another time, but, but I will say this. If I can break this down as simply as I can for you, like the storehouse in the Old Testament is the temple, and we don't have that system here today. We still live, though, with an expectation from the Lord to, to give back what he's given us. Now, Jesus affirms tithing in the Gospels. Paul spoke about it in his New Testament letters. 10% is kind of the benchmark. You can do more if you want. We're not under Old Testament law anymore, so it's not just 10%. But the point of, of tithing is simply this. I give a little bit back to God who owns it all anyway. Like, God owns it all. He asks for a little bit back. So if I withhold giving back to God, I'm withholding what he's actually given to me. It's not yours. It belongs to him, right? And by giving it back to God, what we're saying, we're saying, God, I trust you to provide all the needs that I have. I give this small amount back to you with an expectation that I will lack nothing. You'll care for me. You'll care for my family. You'll, you'll care for everybody that is in my circle. You'll take care of us. And everybody can give 10% of, of something. I think that's why God doesn't give a dollar amount. It's not like God says, hey, you should give 20 shekels according to the temple system or whatever. Like, God doesn't do that. He's, it's 10%. Why? Because 10% is for everyone. He assigns a proportion. We can all participate with that. He doesn't ask for 90%. 90% is too much. No, no, no. 10. I'll, I'll do 10. Why? Because that small amount can show that he can do something great and extravagant through something that's insignificant. That's why you can't say, well, pastor, I make minimum wage. I can't participate. I can't do it. No, God, God, God says it doesn't matter. It's, just, it's a percentage. It's just 10%, period. Whatever you got. If you've got something and your amount can be used by God to do something extraordinary, do not diminish what you have because God can do the extravagant through the insignificant. But it does take faith. And that leads to this third and final principle this morning. That God's abundance always, and I mean always, follows our faith. They are connected. They are linked. You cannot have one without the other. His abundance follows when we step out in faith. 
So here she is. Here's this widow. She's got her sons. She's in her room. The doors are shut. There's jars everywhere. There's the oil in front of her. And if you're this widow, I mean, I mean, I always think about it. You went this far to get the empty jars, right? So, I mean, you're going to go through with, with this, aren't you? <laughs> like, you got nothing to lose to start pouring the oil. It right? sounds kind of crazy, but just, just start doing it. I mean, your sons, they're as good as slaves anyway. What do you got to lose? And so she begins to do that. Verse 5. She did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her, and she filled one jar after another, and soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar, she said to one of her sons. There aren't any more, he told her. And then the oil stopped flowing. When she told the man of God what happened, now notice Elijah's not present here, by the way. Why is that? I think if, if Elisha was present, she could give Elisha credit. Hey, the prophet did this. No, Elisha's not here. This is a God thing for sure. Only God could do this. So Elisha says to her, sell the olive oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what's left over. This was personal. This is a miracle of personal provision from God. I think that's something that, that perhaps we don't always just wrap our, our minds around, our heads around. God's provision is personal. This God, your God, is saying, hey, I, I see it. I see what you're going through. I'm with you. I'm there. But I need you to trust me here for a second. Trust me. It's when the last jar was filled, the oil stopped flowing. Not a single empty jar in the entire room. They're all filled to the brim. God's abundance went as far... This is important. Follow me here. God's abundance went as far as the widow's faith would take it. As, as much faith as she had, God's abundance would continue. If she had two more jars, it would have been filled up. If she had ten more, it would have been filled up. It's however far her faith would go. And then there's excess to live off of. Another lesson for another day. But I can just tell you that you cannot give God. God always comes through. He gives you enough, and then he gives you more. And the more is for others. It's for generosity. It's to, it's to, it's to, it's to give back. You know what we tend to do, though, with this miracle? <clears throat> we tend to get it backwards a little bit, right? Like, we read this story of generosity and God's faith and that kind of thing. And then we say, you know what? Like, here, here's the deal. Like, I do want to be generous, Pastor. Like, I totally get that. I want to be generous. But, but if God will just give this to me first, I'll be generous. If he just does that first, you know, if God gives me my, that job first, that promotion first, the stock option first, the blessing first, the promise first, I, if God does it first, I'll give it back. I promise. I'll, I'll give it back to God. I'll, I'll, I'll do more. God is, it does not work that way. It doesn't work that way. God is not a negotiator. You don't make deals with God. Not good. You got one example in scripture that folks want to point to with Abraham and how he, I, I can make a case that Abraham was not negotiating with God there though. And God already decided what he was going to do. But nevertheless, God is not a deal maker. You don't bargain with the Lord and come up with something. My oldest son is, is man, he, he is, gosh, he is my mini me to the core. He is argue, debate, negotiate. And it's, hey, you got five more minutes on the tablet. Hey, Dad, I got six more minutes. No, you got five. How about seven? You're negotiating a different direction here, kid. Five. Okay, how about five and a half? Five. Like, my kids know that I'm the parent and you are the child. I don't negotiate with children. Like, I, I, my word is law, which is really cool until my wife comes in the picture, and then it's not anymore. But it is with my kids, right? And I think with God, it's the same way. I don't negotiate with God. Who, who is the, 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 the potter's form in the clay, right? The jars of the clay. And Paul says, man, who are we as these jars of clay to tell the maker? He should make me this way or that way. Like God has what he's going to do. And it's not our role to negotiate here with the Lord. That's not how that works. We have to have faith. And if you don't have faith to collect the jars and start pouring... Why would God give you more? If you don't take the step of faith, hey, I'll do this, God. If you, I'll do that, God. No, no if, you, if you will just get the empty jars and start to pour, maybe God will do something. But if you're not willing to take the step of faith, why would God 
feel the need to give you more. Right? I think it's destructive for us to live a life like that. Hey God, if you do this, I'll do that. That's a scarcity mindset. I don't have enough. Give me more, then I'll do this. If you haven't been faithful with what God's already given you, he will not give you more because you will not do more. You've already proven yourself that way, right? One thing about a scarcity mindset, it's, it's always tied to materialism in a way. Because you're always looking at your bank account or your network of people or what you have to offer and it's never measuring up. And you can never fully see by faith what God can do in and through what you have, what God can bring into the picture because of your faith. You don't think that way. You just think of what is in front of you. And so what does God do? God waits. And he waits until you start to collect those jars. And he waits until you start to pour. Because God's abundance follows your faith. He's not abundant and then you have faith. You have faith and then he's abundant. Then he's generous. There's a story that Jesus tells about three servants. They're left different amounts of money based on their ability to make a profit. The owner goes away, comes back, goes to the first two servants. Hey, what'd you do with my money? I doubled it. I did this, whatever. Okay, great. They made a profit. He goes to the third guy. The third guy is terrified he'll lose. He's afraid of risk, okay? So he buries his little coin he's got into the ground. It's like, it's like my, you know, our, our grandparents or great-grandparents who lived through the Depression, what do they do? They didn't trust banks. They stuffed cash in shoeboxes and mattresses, like whatever. This guy puts it in the ground. I don't trust nobody. I'm afraid of risk. I'm holding on to this. And the owner says, you're a wicked servant. You didn't do anything with what I gave you. Now, there's a whole other thing we can go down with, with this story. But one of the big takeaways of the story is this. That if you're faithful with what God has given you, remember I said the first point, do not diminish what you have. If you're faithful with what God has given you, God can bless you with more. He doesn't always bless you with more, but he can bless you with more. That's a, that, that's a requirement, really, for blessing with more, that you're faithful with what little bit that you do have, that you have been given. Father-in-law is, is he's 83, and and he grew up in the foothills of Pickens County, and he he grew up in extreme poverty. They didn't have much running water. I think they even had running water through most of his childhood. And we're talking like I hear people all the time say things like, "Well, I'm 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 broke, you know, <laughs> like you ain't that broke. I'm starving." <laughs> Yeah, I, don't, I, I had this conversation my, with my son. I don't think you're really starving. You know what Papa did when he was growing up? No, he ate possum. Because there were some winters where that's what you had for meat. And sometimes that coon looked pretty good too, and they'd, they'd get one of them. Because they didn't have money. He dropped out of elementary school to help his family make ends meet. It was, a, it was an impoverished life that he grew up. If you grew up with a poverty mentality, you tend to have a couple unique characteristics. One of them is, is, is <laughs> you eat everything. Like, even the stuff he doesn't like, he'll eat because he, he don't know. I mean, it's just trained that way. I mean, I eat again. Like, that was his mind mindset. You also have this mindset that you don't throw nothing away. And it's not because you're a hoarder with a disorder. You don't throw anything away because you're thinking, I, I, I may have to reuse it. We had to reuse all kinds of stuff. I got to reuse If you go to his land today, or where the storage shed, inside the storage shed are glass bottles and all kinds of stuff because he's reusing all kinds of things. You never know. I might have to jerry-rig this thing up over here. I may not be able to afford to get it fixed. I got to make it work. And there's stuff everywhere. It just, it, it's just unique about somebody who comes from that background because you've been there and you're like, I just, I just got to make sure I'm sufficient on my own. That, that's kind of a fad today for a lot of folks. There's a lot of folks who, it's kind of fun to watch some of these, some of the more city type people and they're like, you know, we're going to get chickens and we're going to get a pig and we're going to do all kinds of great stuff because it's the cool thing to do and, and, and my father-in-law looks at that kind of thing and he's like, why? Like, I came from that. I would never go back. I, I'm, I'm, I'm good. But that's the other unique characteristic is when you get out of poverty, and he did. My wife and her siblings grew up, they didn't have a lot, but they grew up better than he did. And once you get out of poverty, you don't ever want to go back, right? You never want to go back. Yes, that's the one of the things you just never want to experience. 
and, 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 and he's had seasons where he was scraping change together to fill up his truck to go to work, and he's had seasons where, and he's in one right now, because the Lord's been good to him, where he don't worry about it. He just fills his truck up and give it a second thought. And I've talked to him a lot over the years, and just talking to other folks, and I've kind of learned a few things about people. One, if you're in a season where you don't got to think about anything, I'm just going to fill my truck up, I'm just going to go to the store and get this or that, and it just is not even a thought to you because the Lord's blessed you so much like that. I think it's harder for, for people in that season to live in the abundance that God wants to give them. They say, why is that? Because before you had nothing to lose all you had was faith <laughs> so you're clinging to God and now as you're living in, in blessing all of a sudden it, things begin to change a little bit and you have a different battle and now your battle is why continue to live abundantly and keep pouring or do I scale back and say I've got enough I'm good I'll tip God a little bit here my pouring days are done I'm good and that's the challenge. Because what you once possessed now possesses you. And what you once owned now actually owns you in the process. You were living abundantly and now you've gone back to a scarcity mindset. And the only way to defeat scarcity, the only action you can take, the only remedy that you have, is to find an empty jar and start pouring. Pour your life out. You know, it's all, it's just, this is bigger than money today, guys. Pour, pour your life out. Pour out who you are. Pour out what God has given you, what God has blessed you with to other people. Take the time that God's given you and pour it out. Pour out your prayers. Pour out your compassion. Pour out your generosity. Pour out your forgiveness. Pour out your grace. Pour out your love. Find these jars. Find these people and pour out into them what God has given you. And as you pour yourself out, you know what God does. He never fails to do this. As you pour yourself out, God refills you. He refills you. He refills your money. He refills your time. He refills your energy. He refills your skill set. He refills your network. He refills what you empty out into other people. Because God is an infinite source. He is the God of abundance. Rodney, come on up. I hope, I hope today, for some of you in the room, this is, this is like, hey, I've been there, done that, pastor, I got it. Okay, good. It's a good refresher for you. But for others in the room, perhaps this is kind of new stuff for you. And I hope today what gets stuck is that when you feel like you can't, I just can't afford to spend the time here. I can't afford to give to that. I can't afford to do this. I hope you realize you, you cannot afford not to. You can't afford not to. You have to have faith to pour because you belong to the God of more. Christ came to give you a rich and satisfying life, a life of more, of abundance, of generosity. Not for your own personal enjoyment, though that's okay, but for that you will pour out to other people, right? That you will share this with others in hopes they might come to know the God of more as well. I strongly believe that God wants us to live in abundant generosity as followers of Jesus. But also as, as a church community, I think he wants that for us as well. I mean, at Radiant Church, we're not going to have a scarcity mindset. We're just, we're just not going to do it. Do we have needs? 100%. Yeah, we have needs. We ne never not going to have needs. You always have need. And we believe God will meet those needs. And we trust God to meet those needs, right? But we're not going to live with a mindset of we lack, we don't have enough anymore. No, we're living in the mindset of we serve the God of more. And what little we have, what we offer it up to God, and we do what we can because we believe he'll bless us and give us more down the road. And that is how we're going to live as a church community. That's how we're going to live as individuals. Defeat that scarcity mindset today by following in the footsteps of Christ. Right into the Philippians, Paul says this, that Jesus emptied himself. He poured himself out when he came to earth. He was in God's kingdom and all the abundance that God could ever offer. And he makes the decision to come to earth as a man, to pour himself out into an empty jar, an empty vessel of humanity, right? When we 
you see that phrase, he emptied himself of his divine qualities. He did not stop being God. What Paul is referencing there is that he pours himself out into this empty jar and vessel of humanity, and, and he's, he's choosing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live this life and feel what it's like to live in this limited, finite role of creation. He's fully God and fully man. He never stops being both. But he now can experience what life is like as we live it here. That, that was profound. That was huge. All throughout his life and ministry, Jesus does what? He empties himself in other people. He pours himself out in the people who are healed and forgiven and forever changed. He models for us what an abundant life really, truly looks like. And hang on, I don't, I don't really know about you this morning, but for me, like I, I, I don't, I don't want to miss out on what God has in store, okay? Like because I was too afraid of, of what I might lose. Like I, I don't want to live in a scarcity mindset. I want to live in the abundance that God has to offer, who can do infinitely more than I can think or ask through Christ. I want to pour myself out over and over and over, and let the Holy Spirit continue to refill my life. Why? Because those who leave strong spiritual legacies are those who have found empty jars to pour themselves out into because they serve the God of more. They live a life of abundance because they have placed their faith in Jesus. Don't diminish what you have. Why? Because God can take that little bit, that insignificant whatever it is, and do something extravagant through it. I know that your faith, man, is what God's waiting on because his abundance always follows our faithfulness. Maybe you hear this morning, you say, Pastor, like you're, you're a Christian, you're a believer today, right? And so I've listened to what you're talking about with, with this abundant life, and if I'm honest with you, I'm not living in the abundance mindset. I'm, I'm more scarcity. Well, where are you scarce at? Maybe it's giving. You haven't, you haven't practiced giving yet. Hey, start giving back to the Lord. You know, at Radiant Church, we don't shake you down. We don't manipulate you. I don't give you a mini sermon before we give. Why? Because we believe in teaching about giving God's way. I'll let God do the rest of it. Start putting that into practice. That's your homework. That's your application. Maybe maybe you're not serving yet. You're like, man, I just, I've got time. I can serve. Then start to serve. Give back in your service and your time and your skill set and your gifts. God's not blessed you with gifts to sit around. God's blessed you with gifts to do things, right? To love people, to serve people. To It's not just here at church. It's, it's outside these walls. Who are the people in your neighborhood you can serve? Who are the people in your workplace you can serve? Who are the folks you can, you can be generous to, right? It's, it's giving back that way. I don't know what it is, but if you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit's convicting you of, hey, I got a scarcity mindset, whatever it happens to be, hey, hold your spirit, what am I holding back, and what do I step up and begin to, to pour out and give by faith? And of course, if you're here this morning and, and, and you don't know the Lord, you would not call yourself a, a Christian by any means today. But I just tell you, man, listen, the first step for you to living an abundant life is to put your faith in Jesus. Enemies come to still kill and destroy, but Christ has come to give you a rich and satisfying life, an abundant life in him. And you got to put your faith in the one who desires for you to live in the more. In fact, I want to start with that right there. Bow your heads, close your eyes if you would. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need to take that first step to live abundantly, and I got to know Jesus because I just, I, if I'm honest, I don't know him right now. What I want to do for you is walk you through a simple prayer of, of salvation, just a prayer that we're going to make Christ our Savior, and then we're going to make him our Lord. And then I'll pray for the rest of us here today. You don't have to repeat it out loud, but I want you to say this prayer kind of in your own words. It's going to go like this. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I realize that I've, I've lived my life in such a way and done things that violate your standards. They, they go against you, and I'm here today, Lord, to say I'm, I'm, I'm wrong for that. I'm sorry for that, and, and, and I need you to save me. I, I don't want to stand before you one day and... All I have to offer is how I live my life because as I've learned this morning, like that's, that's not going to be enough. So, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you today. Will you save me from my sin and be the Savior of my life? But I don't just want to make you Savior because I've kind of lived my own way. And I've 
done my own thing and I've realized that's not getting me anywhere. So from this day forward, I, I want you to be my Lord. I will follow you. I'm going to commit my life to you. Will you make the decisions? Will you lead me and guide me where I need to go in accordance with what your will for my life is? Life is, is not about me. I, I, I want to make this first step today to say it's about you. So will you be my Savior and my Lord today? Father, for those who are Christians already this morning that are gathered with us here, perhaps they're feeling conviction for the Holy Spirit of a scarcity mindset. I, I pray, Lord, you'd help them to, to be set free of that today. May we not focus on what we lack and what we're missing, and we focus on the God of more, who can take what little we have and do incredible things through it. God and more who could take what little we have and reward our faith by giving us more and helping us live abundantly. Father, I, I pray that whatever it is we gotta whatever it is we gotta change in our lives, whether it's giving, serving, forgiving, maybe there's forgiveness for holding from people. And you're convicting us and saying, no, no, no. You gotta forgive. Whatever it might be. God, may we find those empty jars and begin to pour. Pour generosity, pour grace, pour forgiveness, pour time, pour energy, whatever it is we need to pour and give back. May we be found doing that, Lord, I pray. And help us live a life of abundance, not in our power, but by your spirit. We pray all this in your name. Amen.